Created in 2005 and hosted by security industry veterans, Paul Security Weekly is your source for in-depth coverage of the latest vulnerabilities, exploits, and security research. Our weekly security news discussion dives deep into the security issues we face today and potential solutions in a fun and lively atmosphere. Each week, we bring on guests from the security community to learn about their journey and discuss topics relevant to their work and research. You can also subscribe to our show by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe or look for Paul Security Weekly in your favorite podcast catcher. We've recorded a ton of content over the years, so we created Spotify playlists featuring some of our favorite episodes, including interviews with Marcus Random, John McAfee, and Chris Roberts, to name a few. You can find them at securityweekly.com forward slash starter packs. Welcome back to Application Security Weekly. We just talked with Sandy Carielli and Janet Worthington about the need for ludicrous speed in securing apps. I'm your host, Mike Shima, and I'm here with John Kinsella. And John, it's time for some news. It's been quite a while, it feels like, since we've covered some news. So, um, yeah, let, let, let's dust off our brains. Let's see if we can find some vulnerabilities that didn't exist back in a OWASP Top 10 20 years ago in his first incarnation. And at least one that's a different type of vuln is um, the polyfill, polyfill polyfill.io. So here it comes in, I think, our our class of who do you trust or um, how how trust and identity changes over time in the spirit of like XZUtils, another favorite one. But in this case, I think everybody knows is that polyfill.io was earlier this year I think back in February, um, bought purchased by a new company, kind of with no known, you know, no no, no history, uh, a bit of opaqueness um, to who the owner is, what they're going to do with it, and lo and behold, they've been changing some of the JavaScript that a quarter of a million, four hundred million, or four hundred thousand um, different apps apparently, you know, to give a sense of, of volume, have been using. Instead of the polyfill to fill in like a JavaScript shim to say, oh, you have got an old browser, here's a version of blah, blah, blah to use, they're going to redirect you to a scam site, uh, online betting, something like that. So things that you do not want to see happen from um, the, the, the JavaScript that you're loading, ostensibly from a site that you would be trusting. So... I don't know how this, you know, how what what this raised for you um, in terms of just an AppSec security supply chain. And I know we got to get supply chain buzzword in there, but it's it's a, I was going to say a weird type of attack, but how do we, how do we, th- how should we think about this type of attack? Maybe that's you know, the question. The, the first thing I was doing was just try to take a step back and, and think through like, um, is, is this the only thing that people are using this for? And I can't, can't find another excuse. Um, <laughs> Yeah, right. It's so, it's so um, literally reading after the um, the Googlers for for people who might not know. Polyfills allows web developers to use an API regardless of whether or not it is supported by a browser. So um, yeah, it's exactly what Mike said. You know, for if you need to support people still using IE six or seven or eight, this is the tool. This is not the tool. This is the framework which you put in place that then sort of allows you to use more modern things that aren't in the browser itself. Um, My sense, I haven't done web development for what, two-ish years? But my sense now is those type of things, the more modern browsers have a, the, the, unless you're really using cutting edge, like either um, graphics libraries or um, right. some, you know, some pretty particular things, the browsers have pretty good support across them now for things. So you know, why? Um, Habit is probably going to be the first thing, or hey, we just never thought of removing it, or you know, they came started with some sort of a framework that they got from somewhere at that, you know, like a, um, I don't know, pick one of your um, React or something like that. They're using mm-hmm. some framework default that has polyfill in there. I'm not saying React has it, just an example. But um, I think what's interesting to me about this too, Mike, is just the operational aspect that um, someone like uh, Cloudflare would go, nope, and just rewrite these things on the fly so that they wouldn't go there. Um, that's interesting. Um, I mean, I I, 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 I don't know. Has, has, do you, I can't think of an example of them doing this before. Maybe they probably have, but like, and that's part of, you know, this mm-hmm. is if you think back to the originality of, of the, origin, the origins of Cloudflare as a, um, you know, su- suppressing DDoS and actually providing security response like that. 
completely makes sense that they would do this because that's sort of their their where they I don't want to say where they came from, but that's the, the core. Um, but yeah, how how do you if you're a large enterprise, maybe look at it this way. You've got a thousand developers. Um, everyone's got different UIs, and you know you try to synchronize things, but that's never going to happen. Do you have something like this, like maybe on your front-facing WAF that goes through and tries to rewrite things like this from a, a corporate AppSec or corporate security point of view, or do you um, trust Cloudflare to go in front of you and do something like that? Or um, it that aspect to me is sort of interesting. I mean, the, the, why would you use this is, is a good head scratcher, but the, the aspect of what you do about it, how do you control it too, I think is, is – because um, this is not the last time we're going to see this, right? We're seeing this more and more. No, and I, yeah, and the, the, the two aspects, one, absolutely agree. We're going to see this more and more because we've seen attackers just shift where they're targeting. But to go back to your other comment, I, I also was like shrug, like why – why do we need this in the first place? And it's a little bit of a maybe a callback to even what was it left pad? Like, why do you have a dozen line JavaScript function from a third party in NPM when it's two lines of your own code that you could be writing? And especially in this case, how many of those legacy old browsers are even being used? And do you even care about because they're going to lack something like passkey support, or they're going to lack something else that's important for like crypto random APIs if you're doing anything like that within the browser. So a lot of, for this, it feels like it's just an, un, in in modern apps now with auto updates of browsers, et cetera, that it just seems less necessary You're un, and therefore you're expanding your attack surface when you don't need to. On the other hand, um, and here's, a, I'm going to segue to regression, some cool work from Qualys, some, some really neat research that is also showing a different type of attack surface because pretty much everybody has OpenSSH out there of some sort. Um, and there's some really neat research that is pointing out a race condition. So there is memory safety issues. There's some memory safety shenanigans going on here. But what's really neat is that for a couple things. One, here is a bug that is was originally found in 2006 that re-emerged, was reintroduced in 2020, basically due to removing an if death statement. So it kind of points to the, the 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 complexity of dealing with code. And here we don't even have to say C code in this case, because once you start, I, I don't know what the number is, but once you get over 100,000 lines, a million lines easily, there, there's some point which... Like, code is just going to be complex. Who knows what change is happening? So what I'm trying to tease out there is the importance of testing, regression tests, et cetera. How, how or why was there a test that didn't catch this? And as the research points out, it's also dependent on your glibc. It's a little bit dependent on your environment. And do you, does, was your kernel hardened? hardened with certain memory management capabilities that made the exploit more difficult. So I'm sort of answering my own question there in that sense of, oh, testing actually can be really hard. So maybe we should just jump to some, you know, memory safe, you know, a rewrite here. But I honestly do not see uh, OpenSSH going into a memory safe rewrite anytime soon. Sort of wouldn't surprise me. Um I don't know who's going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> that's um, that's part of the point. Yeah, yeah. The you know some of the guys that are um, working on a bunch of rewrites, I could see them maybe take that up. I, I, I but also, well, I guess even if you looked at libssh, that's still going to be a good chunk of code. Um, what I'm wondering is, there could you could you sort of the way we used to do targeted um, code reviews? Could you take that same approach and say, okay, where's the the sensitive part in something like an open SSH? And then do you rewrite just that part and link it back in? Or we haven't covered it on here, but my what I've been seeing over the last month or two is uh, support for things like linking Rust and C together are getting better. So some of these type of things, people are thinking about it. So it's maybe an approach from that point of view. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, I'm, I'm trying not to use the standard generic, John. It's interesting, but there you go. Um, it, <laughs> I I think how do you you know it I'm, I'm still partially thinking about the, the last story and but I'll leave that out of it for this one um, 
Yeah, I don't know. It, it's you can't. It, it's obviously from a patch management point of view, this one's simple. It's like just okay, cool. It's open SSH. It's out there. Patch it. Yeah. Move on. You know about it, or you should. You should know how to patch up an SSH box by now. And you should know where your SSH systems are. Too, yeah, you right? can find them pretty easily, right? Um, but at the, yeah, it, it's. I don't know. It, it's it's interesting. This should be a big deal to me. And when it came out last week, it's like, oh, okay. Um, yeah. It, in, in a way, I'd say perhaps that's a good thing because it's not a sky is falling. And by, by no means am I, you know, um, diminishing the, the work. One of the oh, reasons no, I yeah. wanted to highlight this 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 um, article because of the quality of the write-up and the discussion they go through about trying to exploit this, going from a week down to one to two days. There's a lot of really interesting trade-offs and research that went into this. And that's the other thing I wanted to highlight is that this really appealed – on just basic research, SSHD, here is a, a not interesting, you know, here is a boring piece of software, but it's out there everywhere, but it's not research on the latest cool prompt injection technique. So I think that's the other reason kind of, you know, from an editorial stance, I just like this as good, impactful research. And hopefully, you know, this quality security research team just continues to poke at like the post fix, the, the, you know, all of the, 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 the sudo, all the really cool, just, boring vanilla Linux, you know, stuff that, that, that they've been finding bones in. Yeah, it's, and I, I think it's, mm, I, I, I didn't know this team well, so I'm, I'm not describing people in any way, shape or form, but I, my sense in general with the, the open, with the LLM type things is there's sort of two groups of folks out there right now. There's, mm. there's those who are like, oh my God, LLM, they're going to, you know, drink that Kool-Aid, Kool-Aid as quick as they can guzzle it. And then there's, I won't say it's A and B, but there's another group out that are like, yeah, they, they want the, the meat and just like to dig into something like an open SSH code base or a, a open SSL and just like just live in there for a few weeks, um, which sounds sort of fun as I think about it. But yeah, so there, there's two groups of folks there. Um, what we didn't get into with um, in the last half with, with um, the folks from Forrester, I think we're still, when we think about these LLM things right now and using them for, for AppSec, we're really focused on either the code or how to fix code or how to patch it or like really right around that. But mm -hmm. um, how do you take a step back and think about either, know, I'm partially foreshadowing here, but either doing testing with it, but also I think the aspect no one, I haven't seen anyone think about is like, can can I use that to help operation, operationalize? And not just so much like a, um, you know, a SIM that's going like, ooh, I found a, a log entry, but um, here, here's a you know a, a great startup product which you should be able to write in about 15 minutes and probably <laughs> make too much money off of. <laughs> Some sort of system which tells me not to do deployments on Fridays, right? I, or like, but that sort of idea of like, hey, we've seen a pattern of when you do deployments on X day of the week, or like, tell me these things, right? That like maybe we don't recognize, or maybe we recognize, but we need someone to poke at us and go, don't do this or do this, or can we come up with something that for a large deployment is able to recognize, oh, we, we, only, we only need to update this one particular library, or this is when we need to restart or not. How can you make that thing? It seems like there's so much space there to be, um, to work around. But anyways, bringing it back to, to, to this, yeah, it's, I think it's a good thing. It's a stand, you know, it's where it's probably interesting to me, what's interesting about it and why it's not interesting, um, how's that for a contradiction, is, um, <laughs> Open SSH, yeah, it's an RPM. You replace it, you go, you move on, whatever. Hopefully, most of us by now have SSH have excuse me firewalled this thing off from the internet. But um, they're claiming 14 million potentially vulnerable Open SSH servers um, versus something like Polyfill or those type of things. Like it's we're not as used to. I think general we we're not as used to thinking about oh where how do I find that where is it you know what's the command to see if it's installed. This is what we talk about these S bomb things. Um, versus RPM or DPKG or these sort of sta standard tools, which a lot of us know. I wonder if that's part of why, at least to me, something like this is like, oh, yeah, just update, keep going. Update, keep going. But um, hold, hold that thought about LLMs, because I, I, as you do know, we're coming up to, to something for that. But one of the other parts of this and another vulnerability I want to bring in here, there's this article about vulnerabilities in Cocoa Pods that has been around for 10 years. It was finally discovered and fixed that even with this Qualys write-up about OpenSSH, one of the, the the lines in that is that the fix is part of a bigger commit that is 
um, to quote, st starting the process of splitting SSHD into separate binaries. So there is still some of this open SSH secure design architecture about, you know, process separation here is like the libTLS that could be rewritten into Rust to make it easier for open SSL. I'm not crossing, I'm crossing streams on purpose here. Open SSL movement for, for our C-based libraries. And this vulnerabilities in Cocoa Pods, again, really nice write-up. It was really fun to show how they were doing some, some exploitation because they were actually playing with some DNS records and some, you know, returning some MX records with, you know, pipes and curl commands and, you know, or shell commands in them. So just some really fun, call it old school type of very simple bash hacking, nothing too um, complex in terms of dealing with like pointer offsets and timing that the Qualys research team had to go through. But what came to mind for in looking at this is that these vulnerabilities, like what are what are the, what are the secure designs in these Cocoa Pods uh, problem? And a lot of it was around, like how do you migrate ownership of packages? Basically, you know, one of the problems was ah, oh, we need to. Basically, the first person to to claim this package is the new owner. And even with the handling some, you know, they were looking about a lot of DNX, DNS records, a lot of MX entries for, for mail. And these domains were being validated with regexes and then being passed on passed onto a command line. And the first thought that comes to my mind is there's probably an AppSec team out there saying, go use input validation. That fixes everything. And I wanted to push against that, that concept because I think just saying input validation is probably one of the worst things we can recommend when we start to talk about secure design. I'd rather we talked about, in this case, like how do you securely build a command line argument? There are positional ways of doing this that a lot of the programming languages support. Basically, it's like prepared statements for building a command line argument. It doesn't matter what your input was if you're doing correct positional creation. Same with why isn't, you know, why doesn't sandboxing exist for a lot of this? How are, you know, how, why, why are we calling out into the command line from a privileged service rather than a non-privileged service. Like, are you running your container as root? That, that type of classic thing. So it feels to me a lot, often input validation can become a red herring instead of having a, a, a richer conversation about what does a secure design look like or could look like here. And I, I don't know if that resonates or if that is, um, if I'm going to succeed in that, or if we're going to be stuck <laughs> onto the OWASP top 10 for input validation. <laughs> Uh, sorry, we've been having top ten jokes off air. Um, uh, the interesting part there in that, oh, don't lose it. Um, yeah, I'll come back to me. But it's, it, I, I think, the, uh, um, ah, yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll start with the comment, and the rest of the, the talk come back to me. So the. It's funny the way you mentioned the uh, parameter um, mm. uh, selection to use that phrase, code, leave it really generic. Mm -hmm. The thought that went to my head is like, hell, I don't do that when I don't have to anymore. I go and I get a parameter library and I have it go and let do all the way to parse the command line stuff, right? Because mm -hmm. you start off with a bit of code, let's just stick with, um, let's stick with C, right? And, you know, um, Arg v1. Okay, there's your 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 parameter, and then you know as you start getting more fancy with your code, if you're doing a waterfally type thing, um, so at the beginning, um, uh, you know it, it's oh we just have two parameters, it's fine, it's great. The next thing we well, need to make sure it's a number, and then okay, well the number has to have a comma in it, or maybe like positive negative, and like next thing you, maybe you want to be able to spell out the word ten. Um, and it, I'm I'm making this up as I go here, but you get the idea. It became more and more complex. Then mm -hmm. you're like, oh, well, we need two parameters. Well, then, hey, maybe you said <laughs> positional parameters, my friend, but maybe you want to do a dash dash uh -huh. first and second, right? So it's not so much positional. As the thing gets more and more complex, I get a library. I just like, and then tell me what the register, what the parameters are I want, and go. So it's, I guess that's a little bit closer as I think about it to a, um, to the, um, uh, um, the, the SQL equivalent um, store procedures. But at the same time, Time. Anyways, that that's you, you made me think about that. Um, I'm still trying to wrap my head around this whole Cocoa Pod thing. It's I saw it when it came out, and it's like, okay, that's interesting. Oh, you know, yeah, that was the other comment. Um, 
I, I think it is a sort of, as you're saying, let's just take a general step back and, and, and sort of look at it from that point of view um, and go from there. The, and my parting comment before I shut up, which was what I forgot originally, which is um, you're making me feel old by referring to uh, container, root containers as uh, <laughs> legacy. Did you say legacy or old school? You said one or two. I'm like, wait. Anyways. Either way, hopefully that's not happening in uh, 2024. The containers are not running as roots. So uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll get some mail about sure that, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, it, it here, it another, so another reason I, w- I did want to highlight this article from uh, evasec.io is that it is a nice write-up. And, and as I alluded to, it is, they, they were fun type of exploits to read about. They were, they were very clever exploits that are more than just here is a cross-site scripting alert, blah, blah, blah. And this starts to lead us into another article from, um, here's a a piece from Dave Itell talking about automated LLM bug finders. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody wants their LLM to basically, you know, where's the vuln in this code or exploit the vuln in this code. But, you know, the LLMs are only as good as what they've been trained on and LLMs, you know, the, the, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this in a polite way, but uh, they're not humans. And LLMs, you know, they don't, you know, they, they, anyway, I was going to quote the Terminator that, you know, they feel no pain, et cetera. But um, I feel pain every time people oversell what LLMs might be doing. Because the point here is that as a follow on to Google's Project Zero blog that we covered a week or two ago with Akira, um, what, what, what Dave is pointing out is that. Everybody kind of wants LLMs to be their philosopher rather than just a very narrowly focused computer scientist. And so what it, we already have things like Python, for loops, and tools. What if we just said, hey, LLM, rather than just be given the generic, go find this bug, I'm going to focus you on to look at, the, look at this stack, or here's how to do math. Here's a calculator, because LLMs are going to do math without hallucinating. And figure out offsets. Figure out, you know, can this be exploited? Is there a vuln here? How do you exploit this? And what seems to be what they're running into is that LLMs are still kind of at the level of that easy buffer overflow that you know from the from the old school AL, ALF one frac article as a as opposed to the type of research that the Qualys team was demonstrating in terms of doing figuring out the timing, doing the nuances of what the stack looks like on Ubuntu versus Red Hat, um, et cetera. So that, I think, I'm not sure where I'm going here other than just kind of rephrasing the article other than, I did like just, it, it looks like a sober look about what LLMs are capable of now and maybe where they're going. I think that's perhaps why I appreciated it the most. Interesting. Um, it, yeah, it, and it's it again. We we were yapping a little bit about this one offline. It, and the sense to me is, it, it maybe it's just from what I've, some of the stuff I've been seeing closer to me recently, is it feels like excuse me, it feels like people are are trying to use an LLM as a, a fuzzer in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, and fuzzing is one of these things which um, they sound great. But usually, at least what I've seen from multiple engagements is it, if you're lucky, it starts simple and works really well. And, but then as you start sort of expanding the use case out or, or like having it fuzz more and more things, it becomes fairly unwieldy. Um, plus how long, what your budget is to get to run and all those type of things. And then back to our discussion with um, Janet and, and folks earlier um, is what do you – do you make sure it runs every time or like do you just run it once mm-hmm. and you forget about it and then like after a year or two you're like, oh, we, the, the fuzzer broke and we didn't know that it wasn't running and it, we didn't know things were wrong. And I'm saying that because it's sort of similar here. It's okay, well, LLM bug finder, it's, it's, it's the it, – people are – I think people think of it as that easy button of, um, yeah, just cool. We'll run that and we're good to go. We don't need to do anything else, right? But that's, that's not where it is. Um, no, and – this is where to tie back to like that um again that Qualys article which I did enjoy I'm going to stop repeating myself now but um there, there's an idea of the LLM as the coding assistant like could it have been helpful for writing those test cases to say oh this is regressing and here are the bunch of different test cases on different platforms or different scenarios as well as asking the LLM 
go f go show me where the asynchronous calls are code paths within this code you know th this file and point out all the synchronous calls you know or, or the non async safe calls that would be wonderful and in a way we already have that if you're using Go or if you're using Rust, because the the, the compiler is going to complain about that mismatch between async and sync, yep. you know, async unsafe. So it's not like you can't quite just go and put all of your underscore R, you know, equivalent functions in your C code. But that to me feels like the fun way of using an LLM, or if you kind of read between the lines, using the tool to already get feedback. The tool meaning the Go Rust compiler can give you that feedback. You don't need the LLM for that. That would be sort of wonderful um, if you had like, and I, I've seen, I don't know if you guys cover one as off, someone's done some work recently around putting LLMs into the compilers. Mm -hmm. um, if not, I'll dig it up, we can cover in a future week. But the thought I had here was like, maybe you're able to just write code in whatever language you think and say, hey, I care about this part, it should be memory safe. And then it's up for the compiler to recognize what languages you're using and then get the overall result down into something decent. Um, I'm in idea mood today. The second one was, um, uh, oh no, yeah. Um, again, using this as a, a, you know, one of the things we know, I'll say we know, people might argue me on this, we'll see. But I would say that one of the things that the LLMs are good at right now is summarization. So yeah. if I'm a code reviewer or that single AppSec guy in a company with a thousand developers, um, hey, LLM, go take this code, summarize it, and let me know the top five places where I should look to see if there's security issues. That's something I'd probably trust it for. It's one thing to sort of give me an area to look at versus um, line 2369 has <laughs> got, you know, SQL injection on it. I mean, that's yeah. an easy one, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, anyways, I, I, I feel like I'm that Yeah, give, give, me, give me those code smells. And maybe, mm -hmm. since you're full of ideas today, John, um, uh, Port Swigger, burp, burp Proxy, is getting some investment to deliver more, as they say, and uh, expand. So maybe you know, maybe you could pitch some of those ideas now that they've got some uh, VC funding going into them. And now the blog post that you know they explained that a little bit of why they want to expand. They're going to actually create a presence here in the U.S. And they want to just, and they're working with someone who's, um, as they describe, is familiar with the cybersecurity industry. So this isn't just a, a, a random stack of cash that I'm sure not many people would say no to anyway. But um, you know, it would help Burp Proxy grow and add more features. I, there is, I'm not sure exactly what these features are going to be. But John, you and I talked to Zettatac Proxy a couple of weeks ago about an open source tool trying to get investment and support, you know, financial support so it can grow. And so this was kind of an interesting, maybe compare and contrast. And um, I would just, you, you always have your, your, uh, your sights and, and on, on these business aspects and uh, you've got startup experience too. So I'm kind of curious what, what you thought about reading this. Yeah. Yeah. Um First of all, Brighton Park, I, I wasn't familiar with them. I can't say I know every VC out there, but um, they have also invested in Opswat, uh, CoreLogic, Silverfort, um, Relatio. Uh, so a few other um, tech plays, at least one other security play, at UX, Glassbox. So they've, they've been around. They've got a large portfolio. They're East Coast based, which is why I'm not as familiar with them. I'm more of a Silicon Valley boy. Um, but yeah, we, we've seen a few changes at Port Swigger over the last year, right? And it's sort of one of the things which is sort of interesting to look at in these when you see the hindsight becomes twenty twenty in a few ways. Like they slowed down on the blog post. Mm. They knew that they sort of recognized that like they needed to focus more on the business, I think is how I remember taking it. I think they they it, they were putting a ton of great work out. They still the blog's not dead, they still put good stuff out, but it's not the regular cadence we were used to. Um so you hit a point when you're in these companies of like, okay, are we happy doing what we want to do? Um, you know, we've been doing this for 10, I'm saying 10 years. That's just, that's a number for me. I don't know for sure. But imagine you've been doing it for 10 years. You know, you've been having a lot of fun, but at the same time, at some point, what am I going to get out of this? Is this, you know, it's um, my family, my life, my kids, my whatever else. It's like, am I going to be doing this one thing all my life? Or do I get to sit, reap the benefits from all the hard work I put into this? Um Conversation like that comes along, you think consider like, okay, do we sell to Cisco or mm -hmm. do we maybe 
what do we want to do? Okay, what, what exit do I want out of this? Do I, you know, if I sell it for $5 million, is that good enough? If I sell it for $50 million, um, how many co-founders are with me or whatever else going on, right? So how big of an exit do I want? Then, okay, can I get that now from, as I said, Cisco, but let's pick on someone else. How about IBM? Maybe we'll buy them. Um, no, they wouldn't give me $50 million. Okay, what do I need to do to get $50 million? I need to have about um, $5 million per year in annual sales, 10x is your, your valuation more or less for, for tech. Uh, okay, what do I need to do to get $5 million in sales? Uh, well, we need to have more salespeople or like add more features and functionality. So as you start thinking through this, and maybe they do it with a, a banker or a friend or whoever, you're like, oh, well, we need investment to bring in to get these things in place, to be able to go out to market and, and sell and, and do that. Um, and maybe that's the conversation that they had there. Or so that, that's a positive thing, right? That that's great. You're like, hey, we, we've we've done well. Now let's actually go and throw fire at it. As I say, put rocket fuel on it. Um, the other aspect, and I, I don't know this at all, so this is I'm, I'm not even trying to rumor, but another aspect could be maybe things weren't going great. Maybe it wasn't selling mm-hmm. as well as they want to, and they were pondering, do we shut it down and do we do something with it? And someone said, hey, why don't you take a few million investment, bring in like a, a new exec team or sales team, have them go and focus what's going on, and you get to just keep playing with the research side of it. And I, I, I really don't know. I haven't looked at the details yet how this is going, but um, neither one's bad, right? Um, Port Swig are still here, still great. Um, I, I think you get to start a clock right. Um, older school, if you ask, we had this conversation 10 years ago, a VC would be looking for exit in three to five years. Um, nowadays, we're seeing it's closer to five to 10 years, um, oh, wow. which is changing all sorts of other things and who's giving the money. But so yeah, they're they're going to be around. Um, I'd say expect them to be Port Swigger by. I don't know who else can I pick on, Port Swigger by Microsoft in ten years or some name like that, right? They're they're probably it, the, the VC is not just giving them money for for we love what you do. They see some sort of upside in it. So um, I I I'll congratulate them on taking the money and I wish them all the best. Yes, and as you mentioned, we we've, we've been seeing the last couple of years of Black Hat some wonderful, you know, HTTP based type of research, some really mm-hmm. fun stuff. So that will, and I think we'll we'll still continue to see that. Um, and sadly, I think there will still be lots of cross site scripting or path traverse or a lot of uh, web based vulnerabilities that uh, both Z Attack Proxy or Burp Proxy are going to be very excellent tools for finding. And I, but, uh, I, I think briefly on that, you know, to bring it back to talking about Zed, it's we're definitely seeing a pattern here now of, of several of these tools which has been around and enriched a lot of people's lives and security for many years mm-hmm. are now going like, oh, we need to go to the next stage. Um, so, I mean, would you, I guess you would consider Burp and Zeds to be competitors. Um, so, another aspect is once one of them takes funding and has like money to spend on marketing, that's the key thing is the marketing aspect, that's expensive. Yeah. Um, then the other either has to put up or get out. So maybe that's what happened here. They're like, hold, we got to keep up with those guys. Um, but yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see. It's, I wish both of them best of luck. It's, it's, they're both great, great products. Indeed. And um, if any VCs want to send us a couple million dollars, we um, are always looking for sponsorship here on Application Security Weekly. Uh, but John, that was some great insights. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you once again for helping me talk through all of the uh, different vulns and non-vulns and secure by design and uh, a couple of references to the OWASP Top 10 this week. <laughs> um, and the one thing real quick for our listeners... Um, I'd, I'd love to hear, I think Mike and all of us would too, stories like the, um, the EVA security coverage um, that really goes through details of this. I'm curious to you guys, if you read these, do you follow along and actually try to reproduce or do you just sort of look at it with a sort of a thinking about it in your head? It's, it's, I'd, I'd love to hear any type of feedback around that, like how many people have gotten their hands dirty as they, they read some of these things. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. Uh, let us know because we can also start to uh, do some deep dives, perhaps even on walking through such things in some future episodes. So that would be fun. Um, so thank you once again, John. Thank you, everyone else. And while you do send us that feedback, please also remember to subscribe, share about us on the sh- socials, check out the show notes. And speaking of just taking a relaxing time over vacation, check out Stop Breathing by Color Theory. We'll see you next time on Application Security Weekly. <laughs>